Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Does where we are matter? Future of cross-continent border collaboration. My name is Malaika Toyo, and I am the principal director of Made Culture. And I am super excited to be speaking to you guys today. I am always excited to do anything watershed. So, um, yeah, so this is very great. Um, today, I will be speaking to this theme that has been given to me, and I am going to approach it in, from my thoughts. It's, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts with you. And my hope is that by the end of this session, you would have a better understanding of what the future of cross-continent collaboration should look like, some of the tools that you need in order to make that future fair, equitable, and just, and also just um, understanding that within you, there are a lot of strengths that you already have that you can apply to ensure that you are doing the right things when it comes to collaboration. So go with me on this journey and hopefully we're gonna get somewhere that makes sense. So when we want to do international collaboration or cross-country collaboration or border cross-border collaboration, the first thing that we always start with is a problem. We come together into a room and we try and understand the problem and then we create a series of ideas or steps that we're going to use to solve that problem. The interesting thing is that when you're doing international collaboration or cross-country collaboration, problems take very different nature in different spaces. Um, and understanding the nature of those problems would enable you to be able to have better solutions or better ways in which you can approach solving those problems. So if you take the individual problem in its own, some problems are adaptive and some problems are technical. A lot of times these technical and adaptive problems meet one another. And in some cases we have the tools that we need to be able to solve them. And in others, we need to develop new capabilities in order to solve them. So what do I mean by a technical problem? A technical problem is a problem that you have the capacity and the expertise to solve. So for example, if you're a filmmaker, you know how to produce a film, you know what goes into the production of a film. Whereas an adaptive problem is not so straightforward. An adaptive problem in its nature is volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous. And you're gonna need new adaptive capacities or capabilities to be able to solve them. And why is it important that we're able to differentiate between technical and adaptive problems? This is because when you come into the space of international collaboration, for technical problems, a filmmaker in Nigeria and a filmmaker in Bristol have the same, to a large extent, know-how on how to produce a film. But when adaptive challenges come into play, these adaptive challenges are very much driven by context. They're driven by what is going on around the person. So in that situation, what is the political, economic, and cultural situation for someone in Bristol is very different from someone in Lagos or Durban or Japan. And it's very important that the way in which these problems would be seen are very different from space to space. And so it's important to be able to know when are we meet, when are technical problems meeting adaptive problems and what are the capabilities that we need to acknowledge that we have as technical skills and the capabilities that we need to acknowledge that we need to learn or build to solve adaptive challenges? This is important because every time we come into a space together to address these adaptive problems, there are certain deeply ingrained aspects of thought, life, and customs that have been transferred to us, which we use to solve these adaptive challenges just because of the nature of the challenge. It's not something that we are prepared for and we don't have the skills for it. And these cultural DNAs that we have are very important because when a person from Bristol and a person from Lagos come and meet, they have very, very different cultural DNAs. And it is key that we understand these differences in order to be able to know what do we need to conserve in this space? What do we need to discard in this space? 
And what do we need to add to this space to innovate? And at every given point in time, when you're doing international collaboration, these are the thoughts that need to be going through your head. So understanding your cultural DNA is one aspect of it. The other aspect is by understanding your cultural DNA, how can you then create a culture of change where you can think about the things you're keeping, the things you're letting go of, and the things you're adding to evolve? And it's interesting because most people don't resist change in itself. People want things that are good for them. They will change for things that are good for them. The things that people resist are the losses that they would experience as a result of that change. So what am I standing to lose if I'm to change my behavior? And so in order to mobilize change or to solve adaptive problems, we need to understand what are people's gains and people's losses from engaging in this international collaboration experience. You are not the same person that you were five years ago. Technology is shrinking the world. COVID has happened. Everybody knows about the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, human rights, Afrobeats, which is amazing, gender identity, wokeism. These are all things that are making us and shifting our cultural DNA. They are shifting our cultural base. They are making somebody in Lagos start to care about the things that somebody in Bristol is doing. And so we are already organically learning how to adapt and change and understanding personally the losses that we're having to make to be able to come to these new sense of political identity and activism. And that's the same way you have to think about international collaboration. Because when you come into a space, you have to understand that you are already get, you already have the tools to be able to say, what about myself can I bring to this space? But what about myself is not necessary in this space? And what about this other person do I need to learn? So change has to take root in the culture or the culture will split, spit it out. Because when you come to collaborate, you have to form a new culture. It can be about what you're about. It can be part of it, but it cannot ultimately be about what you are, um, what you, your cultural DNA is about. This means you have to figure out what should not change. Understand the inhibitors that are stopping people from making different decisions, not just about you, it's about other people. And looking at all the parts of the system and how they are related to one another. And by the system, I mean, when you come together, as a group, when you come together as a team, when you come together to create a partnership, what are the other factors that are influencing those partnerships? What are the external factors? Where is the resource coming from? How does that influence the power dynamics between the people that are, that are collaborating? So what is this about? It's about understanding what is at stake and doing what needs to be done to improve things. Understanding that it's not just about you, it's not just about your experiences, it's not just about your cultural DNA, but a lot more, more than that. It's about psychological safety. Can you disagree, but still commit to the work that you're trying to do? Can you create an environment where people feel safe to be able to fail, to be able to say things that don't necessarily agree with whatever your cultural DNA has told you from years and years. It's about understanding that people have different cultural lines of code that guide how they behave. How do they behave? It's about knowing when the system is at play. Sometimes you're in the work, but you don't realize that all these external factors are affecting how you make decisions within that space. And by understanding those ex external factors, where the money lies, where the power dynamic lies, where the influences lie, who has more of, a, of, of, a, an, of an asserting voice in the space and being able to, to, to acknowledge that and then step back from that, that is when, that's what change is about. So by being curious, getting to know people and knowing that you are a part of a larger identity, culture and system, you can increase the degree of freedom to mobilize change. And so how do you mobilize change? Now, you as a person, how do you do that? I fully believe that leaders are not born, they are made. You are a leader. It is not by being given an, a position of authority that makes you a leader. Every one of us as individuals have the ability to be leaders. And it's not the word leadership that is important. It's the ability to exercise leadership. 
And what does that mean? Exercising leadership is the practice of mobilizing people to action in a challenging, uh, in, in challenging and changing times. This is critical. I'm going to repeat that. It's about mobilizing people to action. It doesn't matter how small your position is. It doesn't have, matter how insignificant you think you might be in the process of collaboration. What do you do to get other people to see things from your perspective? What kind of interventions can you make to get them to move in a direction that you think is positive? This is not about manipulation. This is not about um, persuasion. It's about the actions that you take that consciously get people to say, I trust this person. This person has earned my trust because I believe that they're working in my interest. We, and, and we do that by stepping off the dance floor and moving to the balcony. And what do I mean by stepping off the dance floor and moving to the balcony? It's moving away from the present situation for the purpose of reflection, consideration, and exploration. When you get into a room and you want to have a conversation with someone and there's a sense of friction or there's a sense of you not understanding where they are coming from, why is this person behaving the way in which they are? You need to always practice the act of stepping away from that situation and ask yourself, what is really going on here? What are the issues that I, hidden issues I am unable to I, I identify? What are people resonating to? What are the things that I'm saying that people actually are acknowledging and agreeing with? Your superiority or your um, expertise doesn't make you a leader. It makes you have a certain sense of authority in the room, but that doesn't necessarily make you a leader. It's when you're able to step away from what is going on and remove your experiences, be cognizant of your biases, your cultural DNA, the things that influence you and saying, how do I get a better sense of understanding these people and the people that are in this room with me in order to be able to mobilize them towards getting the job done? It's mobilizing them towards getting the job done, not trying to influence you to do what it is that you want them to do. So it's about blurring the boundaries of ego versus eco. We need to develop new spheres for co-creative relationships where we as partners, we, we behave as partners in an ecosystem and we can come together to co-sense, prototype, co-create the future that we envision. What is this process asking me to do to create a different outcome? That's the question that has to always be at the back of your mind. How do we understand the challenge and do the work? What we need to be asking ourselves is how does our work threaten the system? How does our work affect the beneficiaries that we're working for? What's at stake if a problem is not confronted? What are competing interpretations of the problem? What values do people hold that they consider more important than facing the problem? It's the kinds of questions that we ask ourselves when we step up to the balcony. It's how we're able to be introspective and to be able to say, we understand that this goes beyond me. It's not about what I know. It's about what is happening here. What is at stake if we do not collectively come together and co-create the solution or co-create the next steps in order to be able to solve whatever problem it is that we are trying to solve. And sort of like a, a part of that, a very important part of that is knowing when to get out of the way. In an ideal world, time is not a problem. However, a time comes for each of us where we are no longer helping the progress. And therefore the task is to get out of the way. This is easier said than done. But when you live in a world where you believe that you're an expert and you're an authority on something, you always want to assert your opinion within that space. But a part of international collaboration and being able to evolve and adapt new capabilities so you can deal with adaptive challenges is also knowing when to get out of the way, when to not, always be the one who has to be heard or when to not always be the one who has an opinion and also when to give others who don't have the same kind of voice that you have the space and the 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 the, the safety and the security to be able to share their opinion and to be able to heard it's when to listen instead of speaking and this is a very important part of international collaboration and finally, a point that I want to just leave you with, in, is in as much as you have to constantly be in a space of 
understanding what's at play, understanding what the system is bringing and how it's influencing the way in which you're interacting cross-border. It's also about understanding context and what people sort of like situations are and what influences them, what biases they have, what is their identity. It's also important to stand in purpose. And by standing in purpose is what is your North Star? So your North Star pre becomes the guiding light for everything that you do in this um, in this space of collaboration, which is why when two people or three or whoever come together to collaborate, you have to all have a collective North Star, regardless of your situation, regardless of where your of what your opportunities are, regardless of how you work and the differences with which you approach work. You all have to stand in purpose because if you're not standing in purpose then you are standing in someone else's purpose, which is not where we want to be when we are doing international collaboration. So I want to leave you with this last slide, which um, is an excerpt from a meeting that happened in Copenhagen for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I, I thought it was a really good way to end this um, session. And I'll just read it here. With unusual ease, they listened to each other's insight, arriving from the hour of silence. Much of the sharing sounded like people singing from the same page of a hymn now. We had become one in seeing what was at stake. And even if we did not say to one another, we seemed to have glimpsed a common future through the one hour reflection period. My hope is that every time that you go into a space of international collaboration, this is how you feel coming out of those spaces and those meetings with one common future, understanding what your North Star is in order to be able to create innovative solutions that is going to respond to the ever-changing challenges that this world is throwing at us. Um, I hope this is a very helpful section um, and I look forward to having feedback from you. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful.